In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in your word. Open our hearts and minds tonight as we reflect on Martin Luther's theology as it attaches to Psalm 119 and gives us a model uh, by which we can pray for all things in all situations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so loose end from last time, we were talking about suicide, and we are talking about Martin, specifically Martin Luther's thoughts on it, and I was able to track it down, other than just saying, yeah, I heard somebody say that once. And it's actually, it's in the table talk. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this table talk. When he uh, was no longer a monk, and the monks abandoned the black cloister in Wittenberg, uh, they gave it to the Luther family. So they had this like big ex-monastery for a house. And he had like tons of, well, deadbeats, uh, guests that would come and stay with him when they came up to uh, the university. And so he would have these, uh, you know, big dinners at a big table, and then they would just talk. They would talk about theology and all kinds of stuff. And somebody got it in their head that this stuff was pretty good. I'm going to write down everything he says. So you can actually, you can even get it in electronic book form uh, for free. You know, it's a big honking book of just things they said at these uh, meetings and different people recorded them at different times and they all got uh, compiled. One of the things that they talked about was uh, on suicide. And I have always been of the opinion that the only unforgivable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Right, that was, which is basically to say, I don't want anything to do with you, God. That's the only unforgivable sin we're capable of, which means suicide is forgivable. And the way Luther explains it uh, is very well. And I think it's comforting for, for a lot of people in a lot of situations. And he said in... Around 1524, he said that it's very certain that as to all persons who have hanged themselves or killed themselves in any other way, tis the devil who put the cord round their necks or the knife to their throats. And mention was made of a young girl who, to avoid violence, offered her by a nobleman, threw herself from the window and was killed. And it was asked if she were responsible for her own death. And Luther said no. She felt that this step formed her only chance of safety, it not being her life she sought to save, but her chastity. So this nobleman was going to have his way with her, and she jumped out a window rather than let that happen. And then Luther continues, I don't share the opinion that suicides are certainly to be damned. My reason is that they do not wish to kill themselves, but are overcome by the power of the devil. They're like a man who is murdered in the woods by a robber. However, this ought not to be taught to the common people, lest Satan be given an opportunity to cause slaughter. And I recommend that the popular custom be strictly adhered to, according to which the suicide's corpse is not carried over the threshold, etc. Such persons do not die by free choice or by law, but our Lord God will dispatch them as he executes a person through a robber. Magistrates should treat them quite strictly, although it is not plain that their souls are damned. So basically what he's saying is, it's not really the devil made them do it, but it's the devil made, made them do it. You know, they were so distraught, they thought that was the only out that they had was to take their own life. And that is a sin like any other sin, but it is also forgivable. They don't want to do this. They're just completely overcome in their mind. Uh, they think they have no alternative path. And, but then what Luther says at the end there was like, okay, now don't tell everybody it's okay if you kill yourself, because then oh, I don't know what to do, I'm just going to end my own life because God will forgive me. I mean, that's testing God then. That that wouldn't make sense. But that, and that's really how I've always thought of it. Um, You know, do people, some people do that as a coward's way out, possibly, but uh, are they they beset on all sides by the devil sometimes? Certainly. And I think we see that in our own society today. It's no different today than it was 500 years ago. Or 2,000 years ago. Mental illness. When the 
that you're stated, would you are you saying that then mental illness then is classified as would be classified as the work of the devil? Um, it's the result of life in a fallen world. You know, so it's not everything. You know, not everything bad that happens to us is the devil's doing. Uh, we do the devil's job for him quite well most of the time, actually. So, yeah, mental illness would be, uh, it's just another aspect of life in a broken world. You know, there wouldn't have been before the fall, there wouldn't have been, you know, bipolar or alcoholism or any of these other sins, drug abuse that's so prevalent in our society today. Now, will the devil take advantage some, of somebody who is... Uh, maybe that's spiritually strong at the moment and then he'll just sit there and tap you on the shoulder going yeah it's okay take another drink or it's okay shoot up again you know blow your paycheck this week on drugs or what have you and uh, maybe, maybe you'll die this time you know so can he whisper in our ears certainly but but mental illness is just like any other physical illness uh, it's a result of life in a fallen world okay <laughs> Maybe I should even get into this, but I say that such a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. how, how would that be associated with the work of God? Now, in the fallen world, I got that part. Mm -hmm. But to classify, it doesn't seem fair for it to be in the same pot as demon possessed or demon. The devil made you do it, you know that. Yeah, I mean, I like cancer. I mean, if that be the case, then you could say that about anything. That right, and you can't ever really say the devil made me do it because that oh, that's a cop that. out. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, he just told you what you wanted to hear. Basically, I mean, he's got one trick, and it's been working for thousands of years, so he has no need to change it. But, but yeah, I mean, it's not. Yeah, now what, what is the difference between you know, mental illness and actually being under demonic attack? Yeah, that's a hard question. Uh, especially nowadays, because at one time it became popular to say, oh, all those illustrations of demon possession in the Bible, those were just mentally ill people. And it's like, no, you can't say that necessarily. Uh, so, you know, society swings from one way to the other. You know, at one time we were very in tune to the supernatural. Everybody just acknowledged miracles happen. You know, Christ rose from the dead. Uh, miracles can happen. Uh, and demons are real and they do assault you. And then we got a little bit of science in us and decided, oh, well, the devil is just something that we invented to explain the things we can now explain through medicine. And that's too far the other way. There's, there's a little bit of both, I think. As a result of sin, we have all of these things. Mm -hmm. Mental illness, the cancer, the you know, suicide, to, you know, to mm -hmm. whatever. I just, you know, and Dan, well, okay, you know, right? That's a, a lesson for another whole year, I guess. But it, I just, I don't know. Gospel according to Ida. I just think that it's not quite fair to lump mental illness with Satan. No, no, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. You know, I, I think there are both. I agree with that. Absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes people spend quite a few hours, maybe in days, preparing for this, you know, suicide. Mm-hmm. No, yep, they hatch elaborate plans. I mean, I've, I've got, I've got first-hand knowledge of, of things just like that, where they will go through this whole elaborate plan, and yet when you look backwards at it, you go, okay, all the signs are there, but you never saw it coming until after you go, oh, of course, that's what they were preparing for. I mean, they've got all their ducks in a row. Everything's figured out, and all the details are, are like money's been moved in accounts so that there won't be any trouble, and... It's like, wow, they really had that planned out. Yeah, because Amy's husband you know, committed suicide, and he, um, he, he wrote a little note to her as what she should do, you know, and he said, don't let him 
books and because she was gone at the moment. And he said, when you come home, don't let, don't let the children in the garage. Mm. You know, so he had it kind of planned out. No. Yeah. Okay, well, getting back to uh, our psalm then, uh, unless you want to hear about all the stuff I've dug up, we're talking about the liturgy, because I know we're talking about where, uh, for some reason, everybody thinks divine service setting three is the Lutheran setting, and it's like the least Lutheran thing in the hymnal, because it's from the Book of Common Prayer in the Anglican Church. So I feel like I've got all my evidence for that discussion with someone when they want to have it. It, it didn't even come from, from Germany. It came from, it, it was adopted here in the United States after the Lutherans already came here. Yeah, so like 18, 7, 1788, 1877, something like that. Yeah, so it's not, that's a whole nother conversation. Okay, well, what we started on last time was talking about um, Psalm 119, because it's huge, uh, and it has these themes that we, we'll start talking about here shortly. Uh, but it can be used as a model to understand the Lutheran understanding of biblical interpretation, which is a uh, fancy word called hermeneutics. Uh, it basically is like, how do we as Lutherans approach interpreting the Bible? And we do that in a couple ways. One way is we have our Book of Concord, our confessions, which are all drawn out of Scripture. So we don't consider it to be on the same level, but it, we want to know, oh, what does the Bible teach us about free will? We look in our confessions, free will, oh, and it gives us all the Bible passages. It's like, okay, now I can go investigate this. Uh, but a simpler way, just for us ordinary mortals, is, again, a way that Luther looked at it. And he had this, uh, this threefold way of, of studying the Bible, or doing theology, as he called it. And you have first is uh, oratio. It's, everything's Latin because that was the language they used for scholarly stuff. So oratio, which where we get our word orate, so you read or speak, actually, because in the Middle Ages, when you said, I'm reading a book, that means you're sitting there reading it out loud to yourself that it was unheard of to just sit silently and read, your mouth was always, you literally, like we're talking right now, you would read a book out loud like that. That's just the way they did it. Which is neat because it trains your mouth to speak. So if you read a lot of scripture out loud every day, Sunday morning that you get up there, you can hopefully get through it without stumbling, depending on, you know, like our ESV translation is not the easiest to read out loud. Because the word, next word you think logically would come in a sentence isn't there sometimes. And so you stumble. Uh, that's a different topic altogether. So you, you have oratio. So you read, read out loud. And then meditatio, meditate. So you think about what you read. And in the seminary we even do that when we have our morning prayer and evening prayer. Uh, you read the lesson and then everybody just sits here for like 90 seconds. It feels like forever. But as soon as he gets done reading, everybody just sits quietly and thinks about what we just heard for like a minute. And then we continue on with the service. So that's the meditatio. And then finally, the last one is tentatio, which gets defined as, there's about four words that can go into this. Uh, and there's been a lot of books written about, about that one word that he uses. And... Tentatio is uh, how to say this. Probably the best way to do it is just hit hit the German right on the head since Luther's German. All right, Luther had this wonderful word in German called Anfechtung, and like, well, okay, what does that word mean? And it's like uh, an agonizing internal struggle where you're wrestling with these big concepts, and that does not cover it. It's one of those words, it just doesn't translate cleanly. 
Um, but you have uh, persecution in there, you have temptation in there, then you have your own inner struggle in there, and it's all, okay, so what, what is Anfektung, what is Tentashi? It's all those things. Maybe not all at once, sometimes it is, but that's true understanding of the Word of God comes from that struggle. And Anfektung is something that he uh, talked about his whole life, uh, plural Anfektungen, uh, because you had these trials through everything. So you would read some scripture, you would think about what it means, and now you have those words in your head, and you go out into your life, and then you realize how badly I am following God's law or what have you. So you're wrestling with that, and then you get all angsty about it. Like, okay, what do I do? And then you turn back, right back to the word again. It brings you in a circle. So... Uh, and that's different from the way like an unbeliever would talk about it. Um, so they would, uh, I mean, we, an unbeliever is going to have internal struggles about life decisions, about work, about family. Um, and that's fine. Same, thing, same things we struggle with. But they don't have that struggle with the holy things, with the scriptural things or spiritual things. Uh, that's unique, uh, unique to believers, I would say, of all religions, but particularly Christians. Uh, because that's where the devil is going to meet you at. Because, well, he always tries to use God's word against him, right? He did that with Jesus in the wilderness, he tried to twist it. Uh, and that's what he'll try to do is twist us up in knots as well. Because, you know, the devil hates the word of God. And he wants you to discount it. So all those, all those things wrapped up into one is this idea of, of tentatio. So oratio, reading the word, and it's also prayer is in there. So it's prayerfully reading. I should probably stress that a little better. Uh, so it's prayerfully reading scripture. And then meditatio, thinking about it, and then tentatio being uh, struggling within, struggling from without. Uh, is there anything else better I could say? Yeah, one of the things Luther talked about specifically was that Whenever he was spending time in God's word, that's when the devil came for him. I mean, he, he was very verbal about spiritual attack. Um, sometimes almost too much, it seems like. Like, wow, this guy's really, really being assaulted. Or maybe he just understood it uh, better than we do. But when, when he spent spend time in the word, that is when the devil would come and start poking at him. You know, when you're vulnerable, I guess. Uh, to see if you can, you know, will you let yourself be driven back into God's word to find the answers, or will you go outside of God's word to try to get him to stop? So that's, again, that's that, ten, that tension, that tentatio, the trial, the um, temptation. All those words kind of wrap up in one into that one idea. And we will, that's a model for studying God's word. It's a model for prayer. And it's going to be a model for Psalm 119 because it's just this, you see the pattern repeat itself quite a few times. Uh, but that is probably enough about the Luther part. Yeah, that's probably good enough. And we'll just we'll come back to them and review them. Okay, so starting with Psalm 119, finally. Uh, we do not know for certain who wrote it. Um, the oldest source is attributed to David, uh, and that, that David wrote it throughout his life. Um, others say it was written after the exile, so it was uh, written around the time of like Ezra or Nehemiah. Um, the truth is, it doesn't matter. 
I mean, if, if it was important, God would have made sure the author's name remained attached to it, like the other Psalms of David that we know for sure he wrote. Uh, so it doesn't matter who wrote it. Um, but, you know, scholars love arguing about that thing. It gives them jobs, I guess. Uh, and this is an interesting psalm. It's what's called an acrostic. And you're not going to see this because we're reading it in English, not Hebrew. Uh, but you have 22 sections of eight verses each. And there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So some of your Bibles probably have each section. will have a heading. It might even have the Jewish letters. So like Aleph, Beth, Gimel, and so on. That's about all the Hebrew I know. <laughs> so uh, then each line of the eight verses in that section, like the first section, Aleph, the first letter in Hebrew of each verse is the letter Aleph. And then the second section, Beth, the first letter of every sentence, every verse, will be starting with the letter Beth, and does that all the way through. So that's called an acrostic. Um, one of the things about uh, Hebrew culture is they love stuff like that. Their poetry is not like our poetry. Like our, we like poetry that like rhymes. You know, we like, you know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, right, Shakespeare? Um, Hebrew doesn't do that necessarily. It doesn't rhyme, but it has structures just like the structures we, we had to read Shakespeare in school, and they drilled it into your head, the structure, the way Shakespeare wrote. Well, Psalms have a Hebrew poetry has that too, um, and you don't really appreciate it, I think, unless you can think in in the in that language, uh, and which is going to be beyond the scope of us <laughs> anytime soon. But uh, it's just a different kind of poetry than we're used to. And I guess the way I say it is. Um, this, this little guide I'm reading here is saying that the, the sections and verses are not like a chain where one link is connected to the other, but like a string of pearls, and each pearl has equal and independent value. I like that. So it's like, okay, you have this string of pearls in this long psalm, and each pearl on its own has its own merit and its own value. It's as good as any of the other things in this long psalm, uh, but it's not like... Uh, a story where, okay, I have to read chapter one, then I read chapter two, then I read chapter three. Uh, you can read all these sections. Yes, they're all together, but independently, they're like their own little independent psalms, these little eight verse packages. Uh, let's see. And the most important theme, the big theme in this psalm is going to be, and you can go back all the way to Psalm one, actually, with this too, is it's God's word. That is going to be the main theme, is God's word, God's law. And it's going to talk about scripture over and over and over and over. And especially in this psalm, they are going to uh, talk about it basically in every verse, um, in one way or another. They have different words for God's written revelation, what we call scripture. So we have the word law, Torah. 25 times in Psalm 119. Uh, so the parent verb of Torah means teach or direct or law or revelation. Uh, and it can be used as a, uh, a command to speak about the entire body of law. So that's just in the word law, that word Torah. And then you have word, okay? Dabar used 24 times. And that is the idea of spoken word. So reading, speaking as you read God's word out loud. And then you have the word judgments. Okay, mispatim. mispatim. And that's used 23 times. Uh, and that word comes from a, a word shafet, which means to judge, to determine, to regulate, to order, to discern. It has all these meanings in it. Uh, because they, they judge concerning our works and our words, and then it shows the rules by which we should be regulated. So it's very law-heavy. Uh, and then it makes us discern what is right 
and wrong. So you have judge, determine, regulate, order, discern, all those things wrapped up in one, because that is what God's law does. That's what God's word does. You know, it, uh, it judges us, and then it shows us the rules we should follow, and then it shows how they should be regulated, and then it makes us look and go, okay, is what I'm doing right or wrong? Now, if we want to go catechism on it, that would be the three uses of the law that we all learned in, in Sunday school, right? So the first use of the law is as a curb. Okay, so when you're driving down the road and your car bumps into the curb and it kind of keeps you in the lane, keeps you on the path, more or less. So God's law in the first use is a, a curb, and what that means is it's for everybody, not just believers, it's for the whole world. That is the law written on our hearts. You know, a child knows, don't take stuff that's not yours. A child knows, don't hit people, right? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal as we get older, um, right? You don't kill people, right? Everybody just instinctively knows that right from wrong unless they are a sociopath and they cannot tell right from wrong, right? So that, that word, the law being used as a curb keeps society from just falling into chaos. Because not everybody is a believer, but God puts that law in our hearts that the, even you know, the most pagan among us has some knowledge of right and wrong, built in instinctually. Otherwise, it'd be every man for himself, right? And then the world would just burn. Okay, so that's the first use of the law. And then now the second use of the law is the mirror, right? So that is when we look in the mirror and you see, well, I don't like looking in the mirror. Well, that's God's law is a mirror held up to your life going, showing you, okay, uh, yeah, I, I, wow, yeah, I suck. <laughs> I'm not so good at this. What do I do? So that, it, second use of the law, the mirror shows you you are a sinner. And that it also starts to point you to the solution. But that's the job of the gospel, is the solution. The gospel is, is Christ crucified for your forgiveness. So the mirror shows you you're a sinner and you are in need of salvation. Okay, so that only applies to believers. And then the third use of the law is one that another one that theologians like to debate about. And I don't understand what the big deal is, honestly. The third use of the law is, okay, I've learned right from wrong. I've learned you know, my Ten Commandments. I know what God expects me to do. I know I don't always do it and I need to repent, but... Well, how do I live my life according to the way God wants me to live it? Ah, that's the third use of the law. It's the same Ten Commandments, but that use of the law is the guide. What does a God-pleasing life, life look like? It looks like the Ten Commandments being kept. So the things we're not supposed to do, we don't do, and the things that we should be doing, we actually do. And then when we don't, it turns into the second use again. It turns into the mirror and brings us right back to confession and absolution. So that is that third use of the law, that's our, our sanctification, our, our life as saints, God's saints, after we are saved. That's okay, this is what our life should look like. And then again, because only one was ever able to do it perfectly, we'll immediately see that we have to return right back to the second use. So that one also, third use is also only for Christians. So, so all these different thoughts about the word here. Now, when we got to be a little bit careful to, to use these words correctly, and it gets a little hinky sometimes dealing with um, Jewish thought, because when they talk about the law, they're they're talking about you know like the law and the prophets. So they're talking about their Bible, right? doesn't necessarily mean it's all, when we think of law, we think of the Ten Commandments, things we're supposed to do, right? Things we're not supposed to do. That's not exactly what they're talking about. They're just talking about God's revealed word. They call it the law. Uh, they still had hope in the promise of a Messiah to come, uh, which they lost sight of badly at some point. But, uh, you know, scripture for, for uh, the Jewish thinker, they call it the law. That's just the word they use for where we would say there's law and gospel there. Um, but that's a distinction we don't have to get too hung up about. But 
whenever we see this, we're going to see this in this, you see it in the Psalms anyway, uh, especially Psalm 1, you know, I, I delight, you know, my delight is in your law, I meditate upon it day and night. So I meditate on what you have revealed to me about God. What has he revealed to, to me about himself? And then Psalm 119 is going to do that. They all do it. They're all going to talk about law, law, your statutes, your testimonies, all this. So it's just different words saying the same thing, which is the revealed uh, words of God, not necessarily just a cut and dried law, things you're supposed to do or not do. And yeah, and then testimonies is used like 23 times, and that is, uh, of course, used for, uh, related to the word for witness. So to obey God's testimonies uh, signifies loyalty to the terms of the covenant that he made with us. So God makes a covenant with man, we honor the covenant or don't, as the case may be, and then... And, and, but then you know where you stand. You always know where you stand with God. There's never a question. Uh, okay, commandments used 22 times. And that's the straight authority of what is said, the right to give orders. So that is God's right as God to give you commands, commandments. Then statutes, uh, which is derived from the word for engrave or inscribe. And that is the idea of you know, the written word of God, which has God's authority behind it. So God has the authority and the power to deliver to us his testimonies, his words, just like he gave it to Moses on the, Moses on the mountain. Okay, here, take these down to the people, right? I, he has inscribed on those tablets his law, his statutes. Uh, let's see, and then precepts is another word we're going to hear. Um, and that is a word that comes from the language of officers or a supervisor, an overseer. So someone who is responsible to look at a situation, evaluate it, and take action on it. Uh, so the word precepts then is you know, word, the word pointing to specific instructions of God uh, to someone who cares about, as someone who cares about the details, you know, God just doesn't give you these blanket things, there's details, there's specifics, and then simply the word word, uh, which can mean anything that God spoke, commanded, promised, uh, it's pretty much like our word, word. And then there's this fellow named Derek Kidner who commented, uh, and I don't know who, I don't have any background on who he is exactly. He said that the, the entire untiring emphasis uh, has led some to accuse the psalmist of worshiping the word rather than the Lord. But it's been well remarked that every reference here to scripture without exception relates it explicitly to its author. Indeed, every verse from four to the end is a prayer for affirmation addressed to him. This is true piety, a love of God, not desiccated by study, but refreshed, informed, and nourished by it. And I like that quote because I run into people sometimes who say, well, okay, Bible study is good, but I don't like dissecting God's word like that because it just seems we should just accept it for what it says. It's like, well, yeah, but when you dissect it, it dig deeper into it, you realize just how intricate and complex his word to us is. And yet on the surface, it is also very simple that a child can understand it, right? John 3, 16, that's the whole summary of God's revealed word to us. You know, he loved the world so much he sent his son so that we would not die but have everlasting life. Um, so we're not studying scripture isn't something that you're going you're gonna to dry it out that's what desiccated means. You know, you're not going to dry out God's word because you've just taken it apart and reconstructed it, and now I'm done with it, and now I have nothing left but dust because I've just exhausted it. Well, you're never going to exhaust it. Uh, and 
you know, like the, when you think of what the Pharisees were doing, they were kind of worshiping the word more than God, right? Because they made up their own words. They were so afraid that they were maybe going to break a commandment that they built their traditions around it so that if they kept those traditions, they wouldn't get anywhere near the main Ten Commandments, which failed utterly because they were sinning that whole time. Uh, but they were making more of a production about their works, why they're hypocrites, their works versus what God has revealed to them. So they were kind of worshiping the mechanics, I guess would be. You know, they're worshiping their own mechanics of, of piety, and it wasn't real piety, it was all self serving. Well, here's what you guys have heard Charles Spurgeon, right? The, the greatest preacher that ever lived, supposedly. Boy, his sermons are hard to read <laughs> and long. But he got, you need a dictionary when you listen to his sermons. He's like, he uses like 50 cent words, like every other sentence. But he says, uh, talking about this psalm, he says, This wonderful psalm from its great length helps us to wonder at the immensity of Scripture. From its keeping to one subject, it helps us to adore the unity of Scripture, for it is but one. Yet from the many turns it gives to the same thought, it helps you to see the variety of Scripture. Some have said that in it there is an absence of variety, but that is merely the observation of those who have not studied it. I have weighed each word and looked at each syllable with lengthened meditation. And I bear witness that this sacred song has no tautology in it. A tautology is when you kind of repeat yourself a little bit. So... Uh, <coughs> It's not like it says, it's saying the same thing a different way in one sentence, which is bad grammar. Uh, then he's saying, well, yeah, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, but it is charmingly varied from beginning to end. Its variety is that of a kaleidoscope. From a few objects, a boundless variation is produced. In the kaleidoscope, you look once, and there is a strangely beautiful form. You shift the glass a very little, and another shape, equally delicate and beautiful, is before your eyes. So it is here. And it's like, yeah, that... That's a good description. That's a good description of the word. And when you think about it, you know, we have 52 Sundays a year plus some festival days. And back when they only had the one year lectionary in that year, every year you would go through the same 52 Bible readings. And you're like, wonder for hundreds of years that we the church was doing that. And how many thousands of pastors have written thousands of sermons? And they're all a little different but they're all about the same thing because that variety is there. Oh. Yeah, I like that. You shift the glass a little. You look at it from a little different perspective and you take home something new. And yeah, it's, boy, it's God's word definitely does that. I mean, you never, you never dig, you never get it all. And even with this psalm, uh, yeah, you're never going to get it all, even though it's going to sound like you know, strictly speaking, it's going to sound like it's repeating itself because the themes don't change, but it'll be there. It'll be there. It'll, you got to uh, let it steer you. Don't let you st steer the word, which is what we get in trouble with, is where we try to, f we try to corral God's word to fit what we want it to mean. That's when you're doing it wrong. Um, we should let God's word breathe and take us where it needs to take us. Let's, let's see what we got here. Um, yeah, Luther said that he prized this psalm so highly he would not take the whole world in exchange for one leaf of it, one page of it. And then a bunch of people uh, memorized the psalm and found a great blessing in doing so. Let's see. Uh, there have been many lengthy works written on this psalm. One of them is by a guy named Thomas Manton, a Puritan preacher and writer who wrote a three-volume work on Psalm 119. Each volume is between 500 and 600 pages with a total of 1,677 pages. There are 190 chapters in his work, more than one chapter for each verse. Yikes. Okay. And then if you guys know who Diedrich Bonhoeffer is, he was a German Lutheran pastor around the time of World War II. Uh, he came here to the United States um, 
and then he went back to his congregation in Germany and they knew, it's like, Dietrich, if you go back, they're going to kill you. And he's like, yeah, I know, but I can't leave my flock. So he went back to Nazi Germany and they hanged him. Uh, the Nazis uh, executed him and then the war was over like, a couple months later. It was very tragic. But uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer made his students, when he taught theology, he made his students memorize. Someone, I think, it's like, what a guy! What is with these people and their memory work? Now, and there's a bunch of these little, just anecdotes about this this psalm. I mean, really, we hear a lot of it in our liturgy, in the introit, um, in the uh, the psalm of the day. Uh, we don't really do necessarily all the time, uh, but you'll see it, bits and pieces of Psalm 119. We know it. We don't know the whole thing, but there'll be one. Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard it in church. Yeah, parts of our liturgy are drawn uh, from 119 and then from a bunch of uh, bunch of other psalms, too. Let's see. Okay, so this is kind of a funny anecdote, and then we'll move on. There's a fellow named uh, George Wisher who was the Bishop of Edinburgh in the 17th century. And he was condemned to death and, you know, he was going to be uh, hanged. He was on the scaffold. But they had a custom that allowed the condemned person to choose one psalm to be sung. So he chose Psalm 119. Before they were two-thirds of the way through it, his pardon came. And he, <laughs> he let him loose. So, hmm. there you go. Okay, so... First section, uh, section A, Aleph, um, the blessedness of those who walk in God's word and the longing to do so. So let's see. We're just going to go. I don't know, how late do you guys want to go tonight? Because it's after 8 o'clock already. But we can do a few verses, can't we? I'm sorry. We can do a few verses, can't we? I was just going to say it's after 8 already. Well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. All right. All right, well, I'm just going to read verses 1 to 8, the first section, real quick, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, okay. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies. Hearing those words already we just talked about, right? Testimonies, uh, way, uh, law. Who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. So, it's like verses 1 and 2. So, blessed are the undefiled the way those whose way is blameless the undefiled uh, so try to connect this to us today so even I mean actually it connects to every every day that's what's so great about God's word so if you live your life undefiled in the way, right? Yeah. No. Um, untarnished. Mm -hmm. that, that's the right, so what what would the world say to that? What yeah. there would be like that's boring, right? Seriously? It's like really? <laughs> it's like watch uh I'm trying to think it's like well I imagine what it's what people looked at when they looked at the Puritans. And it's like, look at these boring people. You know, they're the psalm singers because it's the only music they could have. So, like, look, look how boring these people are. They're not living life. They're they're letting life pass them by because they're so. Yeah, but that's that's the way the world talks. So, what they would say today is, if you're not sinning, you're not having a very good time, right? So, you can't have any fun. Because anything that's fun is against God's law, probably, right? Well, we know that's not true, but that is the way the world thinks. 
So one who walks in God's word knows the blessedness of living and enjoying an undefiled life. I would say knows the joy of trying to live an undefiled life because we know we don't do it. But I think we all understand that too, that we're not not perfect. That's so difficult. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it's, it's easy to sin, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you know, mm-hmm. just because we have salvation in Christ died. But I think we still too often try to impress God. Yeah. yeah. How, you know, get, get an attaboy. You know, where did you go? Did you see me? You know, I did that there. So, Mom, and, look at me. Mom, look at me. Mom, look at me. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, you know, and I'm not saying that. And, and he does give us attaboys. You know, mm-hmm. we have the blessings and all. But when we do something, not with a wrong heart, but not with a pure and undefiled heart. <laughs> right. I mean, and then right there, what you're thinking, I'm thinking Psalm 51. You know, created me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, that's, that is that is what's so great about the Psalms being the church's prayer book is there's every situation is covered that you can think of. You might have to look a while, but they're there. Um, yeah, and another way I think it's good to keep in mind Two is, okay, so we know how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. Okay, so that's a perfect description of Jesus because he's the only one that has ever done that. So I think it's important, too, to think, okay, how do I see Christ in this psalm? Because they're all about him. Uh, if you recall Luke 24, right? That's the road to Emmaus. All right, so this is late on Easter Sunday. Um, a couple of disciples are walking down from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and all of a sudden Jesus pops up on the road next to them, but they can't tell it's him yet. And they're like, oh, well, what are you guys so mopey for? It's like, well, didn't you? Are you the only one in Jerusalem that didn't, didn't know what happened? And uh, here's what happened. He goes, well, and Jesus says, well, you know, if you look at the scriptures, the, everything in the law and the prophets and the Psalms is about the Christ, blah, blah, blah. So it's like everything in the scripture is about Christ. And then they go, he breaks the bread, they see who it is, and poof, he disappears, which is awesome. But you just sat there on that road, and you just opened the scriptures up to him because everything is about me. And, and I love that. I love that story, and I love looking at the Psalms going, okay, I know I can't do this, but how does Christ do this for me? How has he done that for me? You know, how then do I try to emulate that? Okay, so true blessing, true blessedness is one who walks in God's word. Uh, and I think we can tie that in even to, you know, a little Paul, Right? Because when we finally start learning how to die to ourselves and live for others, then we realize that that's when we're finally free. You know, we're enslaved when it's all about me. But when I make it all about my neighbor, then I'm truly set free. And that is exactly what what this first couple of verses of the psalm are saying. So that's what walking in God's word is, knowing the blessedness of living and enjoying an undefiled life because it's a life lived for others, which again is exactly what Christ did for us. And then we can say, you know, the psalm is telling us, blessed are the undefiled, blessed are those who keep the testimonies. We can say that, you know, God is the one who is blessed. God is the one who is holy and perfect. And his words show us how to share in that. How do I get some of that blessedness? How do I make that part of my life? And the way it is, is to, okay, there's that third use of the law we talked about. This is what, what does that look like? It looks like me 
sharing my blessings with my neighbor, living for, for his good, not my own. Yeah, it's interesting. That's a note I'm reading here. It says that uh, a lot of surveys and, and data that they have compiled over the years demonstrate that those who live lives in general conformity to God's standards are happier, enjoy life more, and are more content. But the illusion remains that for many, a defiled life is more fun. It's like, but the people who actually try Again, our trying doesn't merit us anything, but it's, it is what we're supposed to be doing. Those who try to follow God's lead and how to live are actually happier than those who are just out having a wild time. Well, that's been proven in hospitals. Yeah. Christians do. Yeah, mm -hmm. that didn't live any way, but their, their illness is not as devastating. I mean, the same diagnosis, yeah, I mean, you know, the same illness, same diagnosis. But it's handled completely different. Yeah, I'm. And the outcome may still be the same, but you know, the death of one of a believer and the death of a non-believer are two completely separate. Yeah, and that's that's something that's really particularly interesting to me in the past. You know, since this virus thing happened, because right right before we started getting quarantined the first time, uh, one of my brother pastors, his wife was diagnosed with stump stage four stomach cancer. Uh, and he sends out a text every day, except Sundays, giving us an update on how she's doing. And you know, normally stage four stomach cancer, that would have been you know, eight months ago or six months ago already, she would have been gone. She's still here. Uh, and it's just showing every day, it's like, okay, well this happened, or here's a setback. It's now like, oh yeah, look how awesome everything's going. It's like, here's, you know, today, here's the setbacks we had. But it's okay. And it's like you start to really realize, okay, there's someone who's actually, they're actually living the talk. It's like, okay, here's this horrible thing, but this horrible thing is drawing hundreds of people together in these daily texts every day thinking about it. Second of all, uh, they are actually, okay, well, here's the setback. Maybe we're going to be on hospice again, or maybe not. Either way, it's going to be according to God's plan, not ours. So they've, again, they're, they're set free by not worrying about it. Because it's, it's going to be a blessing this way, and it's going to be a blessing. Hard to believe, but it'll be a blessing this way too. Uh, and, and actually watching a family going through this and then putting it all out there for everybody to see, it's like, okay, I'm starting to get it. I mean, kind of, we think we get it, but when you actually are watching a, a group of people living this every day, you're like, I wish they wouldn't send those out every day because sometimes it's a little depressing. But that's life, right? Some days are good, some days are bad. But every day is the Lord's day. And you're fi I'm finally just seeing, okay, this is... Now, here's some people that really have it on the ball. They're, they're really walking the talk, so to speak. Johnny Harris and Todd is an excellent example of that. In her wheelchair, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I heard her on an interview one time, and she had gone to Jerusalem and was had gone and, uh, and part of the tour was a pool of Salome, yeah, right? Salome, mm -hmm. yeah. And she was standing in the Yeah, right. <laughs> they wheeled her there, and she said she had this overwhelming feeling that she was she was glad that she was in her chair, and if she was, if Christ was there, she probably would not have gotten into the pool because of the hyper how many people, hundreds of thousands of people, you know, lives have been touched by her what we would say inability or disability or whatever. Mm -hmm. She said she it, she was just glad that she said she actually enjoyed it. Got enjoyed, but she was glad that she was not healed and she actually and would not have gotten in the water if that would have been you know so that, that, that's pretty neat. You know. yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, well, this is like kind of an anecdote. Um, you guys know who Stephen Hawking was? The astrophysicist, wheelchair guy? He could only talk with the computer, talk for him. Okay, so he died just, uh, I think it's a couple of years now already. But, yeah, so he had Lou Gehrig's disease, right? So Lou Gehrig's disease, you were normally dead by 25. 
Okay, he lived to be nearly 70, which was amazing. And I, just reading between the lines of some of his stuff that he wrote, I always felt like, okay, he believes in some kind of God, and sometimes I think he pretends he doesn't because that's what is expected of a astrophysicist of his stature or whatever. But when you look at the way his career was headed when he was young before he got diagnosed, and he was a complete screw-up. I mean, he was brilliant. Uh, the story was they would get these at Cambridge, they would get these uh, problem sets, physics problem sets, or mathematics problem sets. And you were expected to like to wrestle through these every month and then present them. And he didn't do it. And the thing is, you w would do like one or two of these. You might have time because they're really hard. And he's like, yeah, Stephen, what'd you do? He's like, oh, I didn't do any. I'll be right back. And he goes up to his room for like an afternoon and comes back and he had them all finished. All of them. Like nobody does that. <laughs> so he was like super scary brilliant, but he was more interested in having a good time and you know everybody just pictures him in the wheelchair you know slumped over he could only move one finger to work his computer and just to realize okay he was like this little party boy earlier but when he got sick then all of a sudden he was able to focus and he was able to do amazing physics you know uh, what we know about black holes is we owe to him you know he was the one that He's like one of the three people on the planet at a time that can actually talk about some of this stuff because they don't, not too many people can understand. But he was going to throw all that away because eat, drink, and be merry, right? And then uh, this happened to him and it focused him like a laser. So, yeah. Now, here's an interesting one. It says, we need God to show us the way to a happy life. And it is centered on being undefiled in the way. The reason we're not happy is that we sin, and the main reason we sin as much as we do is that we do not know the Bible well enough. Apart from being instructed by God, human beings do not know how to achieve happiness. Yeah, I think there's something to that one. You know, it's, we're not happy because we sin. But... They want us to think, or they, or the devil, or whoever wants us to think that if, uh, if you sin, it's more fun, right? And, and apart from being instructed by God, human beings do not know how to achieve happiness. That's, I think that's true. And then walking in the law of the Lord... So I think that's just another way of saying to be undefiled. No, no, one whose way is blameless. The one whose way is blameless is the one whose walk is in the law. Um, yeah, because if God didn't tell us what that walk looks like, we wouldn't know how to do it, even though we can't do it. Not putting that very well. Um, I think we need the constant reminder, you know, that we that we have to hear we have to hear God's word over and over and over. I mean, because otherwise it just falls out of our head. Yeah, you know, I had a fellow. I might have told you this story before. You know, the fellow I used to work for. And he used to ask, like, how many times are you going to read that book? And I said, you can read this book your whole life, and you never get it all. He goes, well, that doesn't make sense. I said, yeah, it does, because, you know, you need to, to hear what it has to say, because we forget it as soon as we put it down. You know, as soon as we walk out of, like, how many people do we know walk out of church on Sunday morning, and they go back to, that's their outside life. And then when they come to church, it's their, that's their church life. So they're like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. I think all of us do that to a degree at some point, more or less at times. But uh, it's like, okay, now, now is my God time, and then I go back to me time, where 
what God's law actually teaches us, what God's word actually teaches us, is that it's all the time His time. That you can't, you know, you can't just come in here for an hour and then go back and think everything's going to be hunky dory. Uh, and there's aspects to a pure life that we will only learn from God's word. You know, there's common sense stuff. Again, like that law written on our heart, right? We know the biggies, uh, but but the true joys, the, the true freedom of living a pure life, you can only get that from hearing the word of God. Um, again, because it has that authority. It has God's authority behind it, so you know you can trust it. And that word, you know, that word law, that is the word Torah, Now here's another Spurgeon quote. Uh, to enjoy this beatitude, a holy walking must become habitual. The sacred exercise is very different from sluggish piety. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. A man may sit down in the road without soiling his skin or fouling his apparel, but that is not enough. There must be progress, practical action in the Christian life. And in order... And in order to blessedness, we must be doing something for the master. And that's a little bit of his reformed theology coming out. But uh, yeah, it's kind of like a new parent with a baby that you're afraid you're going to break the baby, so they baby proof. Like we didn't, they didn't baby proof stuff when I was a kid, right? It's like okay, you just didn't no soft edges and bubble wrapping the whole inside of the house because the baby may hit something. I mean, you can't protect them from everything. As soon as they leave the house, what's going to happen? Uh, so that's like what Spurgeon is saying about just sitting down in the road without you know, getting your clothes dirty. or do, If you just don't do anything, then you don't ever defile yourself, right? But that's not... That's not what God's talking about. He's talking about you taking that word back out into the world and get dirty with it. You have to. So you act as, again, there's there's that freedom. We act as his instruments to take that out of the world. And then, yeah, we're going to get dirty. We're going to sin. We're going to come back. We're going to be healed and forgiven. You know, when he talks about keeping our statutes, and that's probably a good place to stop, you know, talk about the idea of keeping the law doesn't just mean reading the law or repeating the law. It means actually doing the law. That's a good point. And that, uh, you know, you have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. So, am I keeping those testimonies because I'm constrained by them, or do I do them out of love? And that's the, that's the, the kind of deciding thing right there. When you, 
when you're a prisoner in jail and you have no choice because you're locked up 23 hours out of 24, you know, you have a routine and you do, you're keeping the rules because you have no choice. You're hemmed in on all sides. You have to do, this is what you do now. This is what your life looks like now. Uh, but then doing it out of, from love is to, you know, we have a natural aversion to keeping the law. You know, we have that natural tendency to not want to do those things for that same reason because it's more fun. That maybe maybe sinning is more fun. Uh, but when we finally learn to start keeping the testimonies from love, that living for somebody else instead of ourselves, does that make the temptation to sin less? Does that does that change us as we get older? I'm just talking about hypotheticals now. And I said, oh, one of the big things we talk about is is maturing as Christians. And you're like, well, what does a mature Christian do? Does it mean you become holier throughout your life? And it's like, well, yeah, actually, we do a little bit, kind of. But what is the true, truly mature Christian is the one who can say they have no self-deception left to say, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a pious guy. It's like, no, I, I acknowledge freely, yeah, I am a poor, miserable sinner and I have never believed it more than I do today. And as the years go by, I believe it that much more. You know, yeah, maybe I'm getting a little better. Maybe I'm trying to keep the commandments a little better, but at the end of the day, I'm never gonna be able to pat myself on the back. I just acknowledge, yeah, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. There's a, you know, to me, the element of trust, in, the more you trust anything, the more you, you will depend on it. Um, and, and, well, people, especially, you can use people. But, you know, the more you trust someone, because they're tried and true, the relationship is tried and true, it's true, proven itself to be what it said it is, you know. And a little bit of doubt doesn't hurt. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that has come up in discussions with people before too. It's like, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to ask questions because I don't want to seem like I doubt. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. God expects you to ask questions. You know, that's why it's there. I mean, if there was, if it was that easy, He wouldn't have had to send His Son to fix the world. Right, so yeah, just questioning, questioning faith, your faith is actually a sign that you have faith. Uh, you know, you wouldn't if you had if you had no faith, you wouldn't be concerned about the answer to that question. Uh, yeah, and that's why was that? Is that Nicodemus just said, "Lord, I believe, help my unbelief." Is that Nicodemus, or is that, I always get him and the other guy confused? Z- Zacchaeus or Nicodemus? It's one or the other. Uh, I think no. I think it was Zacchaeus. No, the guy in the tree. No. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That was Nicodemus. Yeah, it was Nicodemus because he came by night. Yeah, okay. So anyway, that that's that's what he meant by that. It's like okay, yeah, we believe, but there's still that part of us that doesn't believe, and that's what we need to help with. Um, but if you weren't if you didn't have faith, you wouldn't ask that question. It would never bother you. So, so the fact that you have questions or, or you're, uh, you're questioning things means you have a living, active, functioning faith. The Spirit is alive in you, doing what He does. Um, and then here's, here's a probably a good point to end on. Uh, yeah, it says those who seek uh, those who seek them with all, seek him with all their heart. All right, so if we seek God with our whole heart, okay, that means we are going to diligently study His Word. But there are other ways to seek God other than through His Word. We have prayer, you know, we have worship. Uh, we have serving others. We have you know even. You know, if the Catholics don't want to eat meat on Friday, that the personal piety 
to train your body to uh, do without things. That's what fasting was for. Uh, all that stuff can be good, uh, but if you're not seeking God through His Word, none of those other things do any good. Because the Word is what tells you, reveals to you what, what God wants. Um, so it's a circle. And I would say that you know, prayer and worship and all of those things, that's just us repeating God's words back to Him, right? You know, so it's like, you know, Jesus teaches how to pray. Here, he gives you the prayer, right? And then, uh, you know, our liturgy in church, every single word of it comes out of the Bible from someplace. You know, all of it. it it's, just our, it's all soaked in the word. So no matter how we seek God or however we seek to have God serve us what he has to give us on a Sunday morning, it's all all the different parts of the service that can give us forgiveness of sins and assure us of our salvation, but they all ultimately start in the Word because that's where the service comes from. Obviously, the readings come from. Uh, that's what the sermon's about comes from the Word. So that because that's how God reveals Himself to us today. When it says our whole heart, uh, thinking crazy again. <laughs> Our heart, our heart is not holy. Our heart is not, it, it is not holy, holy. You know, H-O-L-Y, W-H-O-L-Y. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Our heart is not pure. Our, and our, there is sin in our, so we need all of that to seek and to figure, to get rid of, or to purify, or to, so we say we seek it with our whole heart, whatever that is, the good, bad, and the ugly. Right. Is would be my whole heart, not <coughs> not just what I feel is the good part. You know, the Lord, I'm seeing you. And if we can do that without feeling guilty or whatever, whatever. I think. To me, that's my whole heart. Yeah. Know? Well, you know, I, just, I, look, I think of like the opposite of our whole heart would be our divided heart or our broken heart. So, you know, if we... Well. But we can't seek Him with our whole heart till our heart is broken first. It had to be broken somehow first or broken or divided uh, the division, the simple, simpler way to think about it is, again, that, that dichotomy we have between our being a saint and our being a sinner that's always at war in us. So that's how we're divided. We're divided inside between our, our new creation in Christ and our old sinful nature. Um, which it's divided but not broken. What you can have other events in life that break your heart, that that could start to shatter the institutions you trust in. Uh, and sometimes that may, may be God, but that we'll come back to that, that. That first you have to be able to acknowledge that your heart is either broken or divided before you can seek God to make your heart whole. Maybe. I don't know if I'm describing this right, but... Um, no, it's kind of like why... The thing that, that people who are you know, just rabid unbelievers and they always want to make fun of like alcoholics or drug addicts that, oh, well, you know, when you have no place else to turn, you turn to God. That's what they all do. It's like, yeah, that's what they all do. That's kind of the point is that you, they, they have no other way to go. They finally realize there is no other help but outside themselves. So, you know, so they know they're broken that there is a division inside of them, that their, their heart is broken, and now God can, they're receptive, because it's been tenderized, that that heart is now receptive to what God has to offer. Um, but if your heart is hardened, then not, that's not going to bounce right off, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like you know, God hardening Pharaoh's heart with the plagues, like he's going to let people go, and then he's like, no, I'm not, never mind. Uh, 
until you until something occurs which tenderizes your heart, you are not going to be receptive to to the gospel. Paul would be an example of that. Hmm? Paul. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, isn't that a great example of that? I mean, Pharisee of Pharisees. It's like, wait a minute, isn't this is that Paul really? Wow. Yeah, so yeah, I'm really not doing a good job of explaining what I'm thinking about. Maybe it's coming out okay. Uh, you know, for some people, they never have to hit that spot that they're receptive. They're just receptive to what God has to say. But other people, you know, they need to go a few rounds of life, and then they concede that maybe there's something outside myself that will that will help me. Um, because I don't think you can be... Well, again, it's the law doing its work. You cannot, you can't be receptive to the gospel if you don't think you need it. So, if you're not repentant for anything, then the gospel isn't going to work for you. I mean, you, how can you receive the gospel if you don't think you need it? If you don't acknowledge you're a sinner, how can you be forgiven, right? If you, if you don't think there's a problem, then you're not going to be receptive to If you don't think you have a disease, you're not going to take the medicine, right? And that's, that's what the Word does. Yeah, that's, that's probably where we'll, where we'll stop for this week. Yeah, so what do we get to about verse 5? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Okay. This is going to be a while. I want to find that 1500 page book on Psalm 119. I bet that's really interesting or really boring. One of the two. All right. Uh, any questions before we wrap it up? Okay. You like doing it this way? Do you like doing it this way, like going verse by verse through it? Or, I don't know. Okay. Sometimes I think it can either be too slow or, I don't know. We'll pick up the pace once, because like we heard all those words that we talked about already in the first eight verses. So we see the theme. We'll probably be able to, to move a little more quickly, but... You know, personally, I, I like the verse by verse because many times you will get, I have a lot, one of my uh, Bibles has uh, twisted scriptures. You know, where somebody will take a, a, you know, a verse of scripture and make it say what it doesn't really say mm -hmm. because it was not in that context. You know? So that's kind of how I like verse by verse when you don't. Right. So I mean, there was a, I saw, it, it's probably not unique, but there was a, somebody was doing like a blog entry and it was about all the Bible verses that you know by heart that actually aren't in the Bible. It's like there's these phrases that everybody goes, oh yeah, that's in the Bible. No, it's not. The Bible never says that anywhere, but okay. Now I'll try to find that again. It's like, wait, that, that's not in the Bible? I thought it was. I thought it was in Proverbs or something. Hmm. All righty. Well, you want to join together in the Lord's Prayer tonight? Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.